evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Tonight is the third lecture in a series provided by the St. Genevieve Museum Learning Center. My name is Stephanie Goodell. I'm Director of Operations for the museum. This evening's lecture will be over who Antoine O'Neill was as a person, not just a silversmith. Presenting this evening is Becky Millinger. She is the chairman of the O'Neill House Restoration Committee from the First Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Put a hand together. That was a it. mouthful. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for inviting me because as my friends and family know, I love to talk about Antoine O'Neill. And I have been actually involved in the restoration project since 2013, but I've been involved in the project since 2011. So it's a long time to have a relationship with someone who's not your husband. <laughs> so when Stephanie and I were talking about this lecture, we decided we would say, who is Antoine O'Neill? But when I went home, I started thinking about all of the documents that I've put together and researched over the last four and a half years actually and I realized that Antoine O'Neill is bigger than just the person in those records he's the person who built that house he has a legacy here in town which a lot of people don't know about so it's very important for us to know that I think especially when that house is restored and we get to the point where we can invite people in to see it so who was Antoine O'Neill and Antoine O'Neill was a silversmith. He was born in 1769 and he died in 1825. So he was in the late 18th century and the early 19th century. So you can change the slide. And for those who don't know, this is the Antoine O'Neill house. If you're a local, you know that is the Mel Thurman house. And a lot of people in the beginning when I would say Antoine O'Neill, they were clueless who I meant. But this house was actually owned by Mel Thurman. He sold it to the Presbyterian Church in 2006. So we've acquired it at that time. And we had always had the plan that we would restore it for church purposes. But it's an expensive project, so it's taken us all this time. So I'll start at the beginning. This is the information about Antoine O'Neill. He was born again in 1769 in Quebec, and he was the son of Pierre Ignace O'Neill. If you notice the spelling of his name versus the spelling of Antoine's name, they spelled their names differently. I don't know why. They were educated. They knew how to spell their names, but they often flip back and forth between various spellings, and I don't really know why Pierre O'Neill spells his name the way Antoine does right here is his signature on that uh, birth certificate, on that baptismal certificate, you can change it. So I want to talk a little bit about Pierre O'Neill because he was obviously a prominent man. He wasn't a peasant. He was learned. He actually was a paraquois. For those of you who speak French, he was a wig maker. And he had learned his trade in France. And in France, a wig maker was someone who did wigs. They actually created from hair wigs that people wore. They also were barbers, and they were sometimes surgeons, and they were sometimes dentists. So in the reign of Louis the 13th, who was balding as a young man, wig making became a, a trade because he wanted somebody to put something to cover his bald spot, make him some hair, basically. So he hired wig makers and that became a trade but it wasn't until his grandson Louis the 15th who was also balding at a young age decided to make it a guild it became then something where someone had to go to a specific regimented apprenticeship they had to pass a test at the end and they had to pay a tax what resulted from that was that Louis 15th caused a lot of illegal wig makers to be running around in France so whether that's a reason that O'Neill emigrated to Quebec in 1750, I don't know. A lot of, I'm going to say a lot of I don't knows because we have a lot of holes to fill in, which is why we're looking at a puzzle. But more likely it was because Pierre O'Neill's brother, Francois, was a sergeant in the regiment of cannoneers and bombardiers for the French, and he had left in 1748 to go to Quebec and fight in the Seven Years' War against the British. And when that war was lost in 1760, he returned to France and lived in their hometown of Talmay. So I don't know if that had probably more influence because once he was there, he probably wrote to Pierre and said, it's lovely, here come. So I, that may have had um, an effect on it. 
So a paracoir again, this wig on the top right is the wig that Louis XV would have had a style for, very flamboyant, a lot of curls. It would take as much as 10 human heads of hair to make that wig. So it, it was a, a position of wealth. Uh, when you had somebody who was a patron who had money, I read somewhere where there were 2,400 leaves or French coins paid for one wig in this regime right before Pierre left. But I have a suspicion that another reason he may have left was because there were so many wig makers and there were were illegal wig makers that he wasn't making very much money. That could have been a very a good possibility. So just to show you those, this is an indenture that I found from La Rochelle in France, which was where Pierre left France and went to Quebec. It's in French and it's very hard to decipher because the notary public who made this was a horrible penman. He, he didn't write very well. But for his term of three years of service as a wig maker in France, in um, Quebec, he was given food and lodging, clothing, and 300 pounds of raw sugar. I assume that the raw sugar was given to him as a commodity that he could trade for supplies and things that he needed as a wig maker because they, it doesn't say that it paid for his business there. So um, he left the port of La Rochelle in early 1750 and he arrived just in time to witness his brother Francois's marriage to Marie Catherine Chandonnet, who happened to be the sister of the woman that Pierre would marry in 1753. So those sisters. So we'll get off of the Pierre, but he and uh, Josepha, as she was called, had 11 children. Antoine was the ninth born child. Two of the sons, besides Antoine, had an impact on Antoine's life. One of them was the, or the oldest, whose name was Jean-Baptiste, and he was born in 1756. He was trained by his father as a paracor. He is listed in documents as a wig maker. But more notably to him, he was quite a renowned person in Canada in his time and, and after his death. He was actually a, a bedeau. If any of you spent, speak French, you know that that word means he was a beetle or a sexton or a verger for the Catholic Church. So his job was to go to the sanctuary before mass and he would clean the ecclesiastical silver and put it in place. He would trim the candles and light them. And then he would also be overseeing the um, cemetery. That was part of his job. But Jean-Baptiste had a very outrageous and wild sense of humor. He would normally go to mass in a very unkept red spike wig that he made. And he, nobody knew really how to take him seriously because he was never serious. So one day he actually went to mass and he had a black wig on and the priest said, Jean-Baptiste, you look so young today. And he goes, oh, my mother died. And he walked away and the priest laughed because of course that was your uh, usual response to anything he said, but indeed his mother had died. But there's a book that I found and it's actually in French and it is translated and it includes prose by Canadian authors and there was a Louis Frechette, if you're inst interested in reading more about him. And Louis Frechette was actually a lawyer. He was born in 1839 in Canada, but he didn't really like the law trade, he loved literature. So he began writing and he wrote a lot of literature and prose in Canada, but he's best known for his caricatures of people that were well known in, in that era. He published the prose about Jean-Baptiste about 1892. But in that, he gives a lot of little stories about Jean-Baptiste and his outrageous behavior and his outrageous and wicked sense of humor and the things that he said. And he was very beloved and he is considered um, a, a historical person in Canada that is beloved. And Jean-Baptiste in, in 1839, there was a uh, cholera outbreak in Canada and there were a lot of people who died in, just in Quebec. And Jean-Baptiste um, had cholera and he was dying, but nobody wanted to go in and give him last rites because obviously it was very contagious. And so they finally got a, a young, young priest to go in and he was giving him the last rites and everything that he would say in the sacrimony uh, versus 
Jean-Baptiste would come back with it as something about his intestinal problems with the cholera, because if you know cholera is something that affects you, vomiting and, and that sort of thing. So, and, and the priest was just kind of overwhelmed. He didn't know what to do, but he finally gave him the last rites and then ran out of the room because he was laughing so hard. And he knew that he'd get in trouble for being disrespectful when the man was dying. But in fact, he did not die. He lived four more years and he died of old age. But uh, if you read this book by Louis Frechette, if anybody's interested in the title of it, I will give it to you. The second son is Joseph Francois, and Joseph was born in 1758. He was someone who, uh, he didn't, I don't know if he had a sense of humor like his brother, but he had been involved from very early on with the British Army. If you remember, I talked about the Seven Years' War, and Canada was turned over in 1760 to the British. The, the French lost that, that land, and so they all became British citizens, where they had been French citizens before. Uh, Joseph Joseph Francois was someone who worked as a, a clerk and a notary, a power of attorney. He was often in positions where I don't believe he was a lawyer. I've never found that documented, but he worked as someone who was involved in those legal things. He, in his will that was written in 1816, said, I will never make an inventory because I don't trust lawyers. So either he was really a good lawyer and pretty knew exactly what they did, or he indeed did not trust them and he wasn't one. So go ahead. But I want to find out. I want to take a poll of hands. Who in this room in your history class ever heard about the blockade of Quebec where the American colonists took two regiments up into Canada and took Montreal and Quebec by siege? to be part of the United States. Anybody hear about that in your history class? Just read a book recently. Well, okay, but you didn't hear about it in school. Um, there was some talk, there was rumor talk. Okay, rumor yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first read this, I thought, I didn't sleep through class. I didn't like history when I was a kid, but I know I didn't sleep through class, so I never heard this story. So there are actually some documents online you can download about the blockade of Quebec, but basically, two regiments of colonists who had the approval of our Continental Congress to go up and try to seize these cities marched. The Richard Montgomery was the general and he marched from the Kennebec Road up into Canada and Benedict Arnold went through Cambridge, Massachusetts and they were to meet up in that area. Well, Montgomery actually did take Montreal and uh, Sorrel and Three Rivers, but he didn't have enough troops to hold them and they were not really prepared for the Canadian winter. But so Guy Carleton, who was the commander in the fort in Montreal, realized the big picture of this and he's like, oh, I gotta hot foot it down to Quebec. So he got on a fast ship and went down the river to the fort in Quebec. He went to the town and said, Okay, here's the deal. They're coming, we've got to fight. If you can't stand and fight with us, you've got four days to get out. So among the people who did stay were Pierre O'Neill, Antoine's father, Jean-Baptiste O'Neill, his brother, and Joseph O'Neill. And they were involved, they're listed. Another person I just found the other day listed as fighting was Pierre Menard. I don't know how much of that you read. That's really all I wanted to say about it. It's a very interesting story. So if you haven't read it, you should, because I never heard about it when I was in school. And I can give you the source for that as well. But the commemorative marker on the right there is still sitting in Quebec on a rock, uh, memorizing, commemorizing those people who fought so in Canada, Antoine O'Neill is listed in his baptismal record. For the longest time, I didn't believe that there was another record before I find him next in another town, but I actually went back through some of my things and, and was reading and found that he was the godfather to Jean-Baptiste's daughter, Catherine, in 1793. So all that does for me is place him there at that time because he may have been gone and come back. He, uh, I don't know that he stayed there in 1793, but I used to believe there was a vacuum of information about him until he lands in Detroit is his next place, but there is no known record of who apprenticed him in the silver smithing trade. There are no legal or civil records in his name in anything I've looked at, notorial records or church records. He didn't marry any time from then, so next time that I find him in records is in Detroit. 
and I said, why is he in Detroit? He's a real hard guy to follow because I was telling Stephanie early, he really flew under the radar in history. He's very hard to find records about, but they are there the more I dig. So what brought him to Detroit, I believe, was the fur trade. I think that he, being a silversmith and seeing the amount of money that had been made in the Canadian fur trade, he realized that it was a lucrative uh, venture for him to get into. How he came to know the people he associated with, I'll tell you. This and it will be my conjecture because I don't have documents to prove it. But in 1796, he's listed in the Detroit, Michigan Territory Census, so I know he lived there three years after that baptismal record was written. In 1797, in February, he married Marie Catherine Seco, and she was the daughter of Jean-Baptiste Seco and Angelique Poupard. And they were names, those two names are very prominent in old Detroit. They had been there from the very beginning of the French town, and they had also, both families made a lot of money in the first trade. So his connection to that, I'm not quite sure if that would have been what it was. Um, but Angelique Poupard was the daughter of some names you may recognize. Her father was Hyacinth Rayom. There are people here in town who are, are related to the Rayom name. And her mother, I'm sorry, her mother was a Rayom. Her father, Joseph Poupard, was actually listed in the Kaskaskia records. He's um, back and forth from Kaskaskia to Quebec uh, in early 1750-ish time frame. So then the next entry is the one that is of interest to me. In March of 97, after his marriage, he is, is found working with John Askin. If you've not heard the name of John Askin, he was a British merchant who had actually been born in Scotland and he immigrated to the colonies about 1758 and he systematically moved across with the army. He was pretty much always aligned with the British army but he moved across the country to what was the Northwest at that time, which was Detroit, so Detroit. So he moved across, he had a trade store on Michelin Mackinac. He was often in the capacity of a sutler or someone who supplied for the army, the different supplies that they needed. But in this ledger, which was found by um, a professor in Detroit in the 40s, 1940s, they found that Askin had given him silver pieces to make trade silver, so we know that at least by 97 he was working with him, but he may have been working with him before, I don't know. And at the same time, 90, 1798, the O'Neills bought a house and a lot from Israel Ruland. Israel Ruland was a silversmith who was closely associated with John Askin, and he had made a lot of money coming from Albany exactly, I don't know if he was with Askin or following him or in front of him, but both of them had made a lot of money in the silver trade. And when I say the silver trade, in about 1750, Prior to that, almost 100 years had gone by where people who were coming in the country, it didn't have to be British and it didn't have to be French. There were Spaniards, there were Dutch, there were Germans who came into Canada and they realized that here's this vast open wilderness and here are these Native Americans and they could trade with them. I don't know that they ever said, oh, we can take advantage of them, but I think that they you know, eventually figured that out. But they realized that in the beginning they were giving them blankets and they were giving them iron pots and things that would improve their life. But along about 1750, someone began making silver ornaments like this and they would give them to the Indian. A trade cross, there's a, I, I've read a lot of information that says that the Jesuits were who handed these out. That's not necessarily true. These were not ever religious relics for them. They were handed out um, because they were silver, they were shiny, and the Indians loved the fact that they could deflect the evil spirits from them. So they wore them all over their body. And I'll show you some examples of O'Neill's silver as we go along. But Israel Rulin was um, the silversmith who sold the lot to Antoine, and that lot actually had a house and a silversmithing business on it, so he could just move into that. And in the first years of 1798 and 1800, two children were born to the O'Neills. The one that's interesting to me is Jean Baptiste. When he was born, the priest wrote in the baptismal record that the father was absent. So what would be so important in your life that you wouldn't go to your child's baptism? 
we may answer that too, I don't know. In 1802, the child died, Jean-Baptiste died, and then the next year they relocated to Vincennes, Indiana Territory. Again, I don't have clear reasons why, but I believe that John Askin may have the clue to that because John Askin was a British subject at the end of the war when the United States was formed. All of the British subject, all of the British citizens, anybody who was not an American was asked to leave the country or sign a loyalty oath. So if you signed a loyalty oath, you could stay and you could continue making money. Detroit was settled in such a way that with the, the ocean, they could uh, reach the ocean from the lakes and the, and the rivers. They could go up into Canada. So it was a rich, rich resource for the silver trade, for the fur trade. They could, in fact, John Askin made so much money, he bought his own ship so he could cut out the middleman to take his furs to Europe. So the, the fur trade actually went about to about 1840 and then it fizzled out. It was gone because there was no demand for it from Europe, but John Askin had made so much money, he wasn't going to get out, and the government, our new government, didn't have the money or the manpower to make them get out. So they were asked to sign a loyalty oath, but if they couldn't make them, then they got to stay. So John Askin eventually, and I don't remember if I read that he was forced to be out or he just made up his mind because he was older, but he actually, if you look at this map of Detroit, and I wish I had my pointer, but Detroit is here, this is the fort, and on this side of the river is Canada. So he just got in a ship, parked it on the other side of the river, and he moved to Windsor, and is where he died. So did he stop his fur trade business? I don't know, but for whatever reason, Antoine did not stick around. He moved to Vincennes. So this, you saw the little cross I held up, this is a replica of Jill Kennick's idea of what that cross looked like. But this is a trade cross that we know was made in Detroit by Antoine O'Neill. You can't see, Logan, go to the next slide because you can see better. In the very center is an AO. It's a rectangular cartouche that has Antoine O'Neill's initials. He always used that exclusively. And right below that it says Detroit. There's some engraving, which is very common. These were simple. O'Neill made exclusively, I've never found anything to contradict this, but he made all of his trade silver from coins. So if he was in an area, for instance, when he was in Missouri and there were Spanish coins, he used Spanish coins. If there were French coins, that's what he used. But he would melt them down and then he'd take his hammer and pound it out and he would eventually have a sheet of silver, which is how he would make that. Beyond that, I'm not sure how he made it, but he was a simple silversmith who used simple tools. And this cross would have been used, and it's about a foot high, the real one, but it would have been worn right in the middle of the chest of an Indian who was of some prominence in the tribe. He would either be a chief, or he could be the shaman, or he might just be an honored warrior who had a lot of uh, war battles under his belt, but it would not have come cheap. And this is the cartouche that I was telling you about. It goes by a lot of different names. It can be a maker's mark, a hallmark, in Antoine's day, they only marked one time. Robert Cruikshank, Israel Ruland, Joseph Schundler, John Kenzie. There were a number of, of silversmiths in Detroit in the same time period. They didn't have a fancy hallmark. Nowadays, and even later, even 50 years later, there would be hallmarks that would attach a lion for the king. It would show you that it was a British hallmark. There were way to, uh, ways to identify them. But Antoine's was very simple. That punch mark, it was made from um, a punch that he would have crafted. He would have carved that out of wax or wood and then poured his silver into, or poured his, his iron into it. And then eventually they wore out. So you can see this one is starting to look kind of worn. His A is a little shop worn. And as far as I know, that's the only one he ever used. When Antoine left Vincennes, he actually was a member of the militia. He was a militia man. And to, you couldn't just leave. You had to ask and get someone to replace you. So his commander, who was Captain Viscars, I've not found his first name, but Antoine had a brother-in-law named Jacob Viscar. And with the way people spell things, it's likely this is his brother because the man that he asked to replace Antoine was also his brother-in-law. They were both brother-in-laws of Antoine. One was married to Catherine's sister and one was Catherine's brother. 
So when he wrote that, so we know that by May of 1803, he had already moved to Vincennes. And this is the original document. When I do my research, I like to get as many original documents as I can because when you get a transcription, a lot of times there are people who misunderstand what they read, especially if they're in French. So I try to get, this one's actually in English, so it's fairly easy to read. So why did he go to Post Vincennes? And if you know the French corridor that came down from Detroit, Vincennes was below Detroit. But at certain times in history, Vincennes was the territorial government, Detroit was at one time the territorial government, and St. Louis was the territorial government. So when Post Vincennes was at the time that he left there, I believe that it was the government over Detroit and St. Louis both. So again, I believe he left because of the fur trade. I also believe he went to Vincennes specifically specifically for Joseph O'Neill, his brother, because Joseph had in his ventures of being a notary and a power of attorney, he had met a lot of influential men, people who would later Antoine would make silver for or he would have some connection to them. So I always like to think of this as the six degrees of separation of Antoine O'Neill because he knew all these people that Joseph knew. And also another person who will come into play when he's in Vincennes is Pierre Menard. And if you know, Pierre Menard is the guy who was across the river uh, and was the territorial lieutenant governor. And he had some, I'll, I'll show you how he had some connection to Menard. Also, Fort Wayne garrison store. Fort Wayne was west and a little bit north of Vincennes. And they had a garrison store there that was commanded by Colonel John Johnson. And I have a book that I actually uh, donated it to the Felix Valet House. But in a period of about one month, they had 10,000 furs given to them from their trade. They traded the silver that the silversmiths made to the Indians and got this, or to voyagers who also traded it to the Indians. But I am amazed that there's even a furry person, a little furry animal running around with all of the trade that they had going on in that early 1800s. It's amazing if you, the book is by somebody named Griswold. So go back to Joseph O'Neill and I'll just fill in because I think he was very important. I think he had a close connection to his brother. I wish I could find more information that actually put them together in places. But when I started looking, and I already told you about all the parts at the front, the first part of that slide, but when I started looking for him, he was actually in New Madrid in 1786 in Spanish territory. He was here in St. Genevieve in court records here in, in 1793. He was in St. Louis in the late 1780s. He was in Vincennes, he was in Michelin-Mackinac, and that's where he first came across John Askin. He met, I know he had to have known John Askin when Askin had his store there. Joseph is recorded as being a witness to two marriages on the island of Michelin-Mackinac, and he also had to give a deposition against a British supply clerk who kind of got free with some of the king's merchandise to make money for himself. So Joseph had to give a little deposition and so that's recorded in history about him. But other people that he would have met in his, in his trip would be John Johnson at Fort Wayne. He also met a man named Francis Vigo. Has anybody heard of Francis Vigo? Do you all know who that might be? Well, I'll tell you, because he's another interesting guy. He was actually a Spaniard who came up from Cuba and then came up through the Mississippi River. He landed in St. Louis, and he connected himself with August Chouteau, with August Cire, Manuel Liza, and Toussaint Dubois, who were both traders in the fur trade, and they actually formed a, a fur trade company. Now, I always get this confused. They had two fur trade companies. The first one was the Missouri Fur Trade, I believe. They all got in a fight about who did what and who owned what, and they split it apart and made the St. Louis Fur Trade Company. But in those, in a, any of those people that are listed there had a some association with Joseph O'Neill. So I think that he was Antoine's link then to make silver for them in whatever capacity. Francis Vigo then left St. Louis and went to Vincennes and he was by that time a very wealthy man. And if you recall the story about George Rogers Clark, when he went into Kaskaskia and captured that little town without firing a shot, Vigo heard about that and, and he just kind of was like, whoa. And so he was the one who financed all of Clark's ventures from Kaskaskia to Vincennes and then from Vincennes to Detroit. He was in fact captured, not Clark, but Vigo, in Detroit 
And the commander Hamilton kept him for a little while because he said, you've got to be a spy. And Vigo kept saying, no, I don't, I'm Spanish. I don't know these guys. And so when they let him go, he made a beeline back to Vincennes and told George Rogers Clark everything that he knew. So he was indeed a spy for him. Whether he went there in that purpose, I don't know. But he gave so much money to Clark that when he was impoverished and he died, actually a pauper, the government paid his family back to the tune of about $40,000 that he had given to Clark over the years because he kept them supplied in food, ammunition, clothing. So he was a pretty important person. And the, there is a silver set that I'll show you that Antoine O'Neill made for him. So Joseph lived in Vincennes in 1800. He married there. He was actually, um, Indiana became a state in 1819, and he was elected to the first borough government of Knox County in Vincennes in 1815. So you can see that he was a prominent man. He may not have been a lawyer, but he always achieved some prominence wherever he lived. And then he died in Vincennes in 1817. This is an invoice from the Garrison store. I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of small, but O'Neill made over 1,500 pieces of trade silver for that store. He was given $136.67 by William Henry Harrison, who was the governor at that time. The kind of silver that he made was, it, it, I guess if you think about it in our time, it's kind of a bling. Um, the Indians wore headbands, armbands, wristbands, rings. They wore ear wheels. They wore ear rings, coned ear rings. They wore nose rings. They wore all kinds of silver. It was a hot commodity for them. And I've talked about this before at the history conference when I spoke about him. Silver became the denominator because the Indians became very savvy to its worth. Maybe not monetarily so much to them, but monetarily to the white man because they could take that silver and they could go back to the trade store and they could turn it in and get whiskey, which is a lot of times what they did. But they knew the value of it and they would not accept them trying to give them brass or something that was not of that value. If you were a courier de bois or a voyager, you were carrying this stuff on your back and going into places where Indians were, you didn't want to carry brass or pieces of, so, pieces of trade goods that were made out of iron because it was heavy and silver was very light. So it was kind of a good thing on both sides. But the Indians were savvy. So you can see in just that order, I don't know how long it took him to make that. I don't know if that's the only one. It's the only one in the book that I found. But <clears throat> it's an interesting thing that, it, that he made over 1,500 pieces of silver for that. This is an example. Colonel John Johnson, and I love this. This is one of my favorite things that I found in research. But John Johnson, whenever the silversmiths would bring their silver pieces in, he would sit down and he would either trace around it or he'd draw it. He made a record of every piece of silver that came in. He did that for what reason, I don't know, but maybe for a quality assurance thing because if you were someone, I know as a woman, if I was asked which of those two ear wheels I wanted, I would take the one on the top because it was the prettiest one. So maybe he did it for that reason, and maybe he never accepted them afterwards from this guy. I don't know who made the bottom silver ear, ear wheel, but the top one was made by John Kenzie, who was a John Askin employee. It would have been worn on a leather thong on the ear. It could have been worn on a scarf or on their uh, clothing. But that's a very nice example of an ear wheel by um, John Kenzie. And then next is an example, the only example I have of an ear wheel by Antoine O'Neill. You can see it's a very simple design. In the center is his cartouche of AO. This one was actually found in a burial ground in Michelin-Mackinac in 1926. Now you would be hung and quartered if you tried to take that out of burial site now. But both of the silver pieces I showed you by Antoine were found there. The, the earlier the cross was found in Amherstburg in Ontario. We wonder why is there only one of each of these examples? Why are there no more out? Well, probably they're buried with whoever owned it. Or another idea is that whenever Antoine would get silver from other silversmiths or from people who traded them, if the Indians traded to him, he'd melt it down and reform it into his style because it's like his business card. He's not going to resell another silversmith's work. He's going to sell his work because then he wants them to come back and get more. So it's like a business card of the day. So there's a question in the research that I've done whether Antoine was a traveling silversmith. Was he 
just a traveling salesman who did silversmithing when he got home? I don't know. But there is some evidence. The son's baptism is one. If he was away from his son's baptism, I would imagine that the only good reason would be for making money. In the probate record of Catherine Seco's grandmother, Agatha Rayom, it lists in the, the estate records that Antoine was from St. Louis and St. Genevieve. I've never found a record to qualify that he lived in St. Louis, but of course he did live here in town. And then the water pitcher that I'll show you a picture of, uh, that it's actually at the Yale University Gallery. It's a beautiful piece that Antoine made for Ferdinand Rosier and Constance Waugh. And it was made in 1812, or they think it was at the time of her wedding, but it's also attributed to having been made in St. Genevieve. And I highly doubt that because, as I told you, how he melted coins down and flattened them with a hammer, it would have taken him a long time to make a pitcher of that size. It's about a foot high. So for whatever reason, in 1817, Antoine left Vincennes. Now I have theories about that as well. There isn't a record. I know that he was there at least until the end of 1816 because I have some records where he signed his name. He often worked collaterally with Joseph. Joseph would write inventories and Antoine would appraise the value of silver and the valuables in those inventories. That goes on from the time of about 1803 when he first came there until O'Neill's, his brother's death. Joseph died, and I think because they were so close and he had such a connection with all of his uh, associates, I think that he lost that association. I don't know if that meant that the people wouldn't deal with him, but certainly he didn't get any new people. But I also think that he began working with Pierre Menard about 1797, and I think Menard knew the capacity, even though the fur trade was winding down by this time, by 1817, I think he still saw the profit that could be made from O'Neill making trade silver for him. He was shipping things to New Orleans and he was shipping as far as Philadelphia. So it was a lucrative thing for him to have his own silversmith locally. I don't know if that's true, but if you look at the records that I have from the um, Pierre Menard Kaskaskia store, the heaviest work that he did, he made thousands, and I've counted 8,000 just tallying um, pieces of, of trade silver for Menard in that period. So I like my theory, and if somebody can challenge me with facts, I'll listen to them, because I'd love to hear it. So there are no clear re reasons in documents, and even sadder than that, <laughs> there are no documents. So in 1810, it is said that O'Neill bought the land where the house is on Main Street from the Pratt brothers, and I don't know exactly if it's Joseph Pratt and Benjamin or Bernard and, and Jean-Baptiste. There were several Pratts. But he bought that land, so why did he buy it seven years before he came here? I don't know. This is a little information about Pierre Menard, if you're not familiar with him. I'm surprised there's never been a book written about him, a, a, a collective book of his his history because he's very interesting. He was born in Montreal. He was involved in the Illinois country and is in records as early as 1790. He's involved with every person that uh, Joseph O'Neill. There was a, a family named Barcelou or Barcelo, and they had a D name of Bainvenu. And Joseph O'Neill actually married the granddaughter of Charles Bainvenu. Her name was Victoria de Lille. He also was in the Indiana Territorial Legislature. He was in the Indian Bureau. He was the agent for the Indians that were across the river in Illinois, Peoria, Kaskaskia, I think the Kiowa may have been there. And then he was also elected as the first lieutenant governor in 1818. So his business relationship started with O'Neill fairly early until O'Neill's death. The names of people that Menard were associated with are some of the names that you still see were associated with Joseph and Antoine O'Neill. That last name on the end is Zacharias Seco. He's another person, if you love to read history, to look up about. He, Zacharias Seco was actually Catherine Seco O'Neill's grandfather and her brother. So different records are for both of them, but Zacharias Seco had a trade store up on the Wabash. And when I first started looking at the Menard ledgers, I was seeing purchases of like 800 pounds of lead and 50 skeins of cotton and things like that. And I was like, wow. And then it, it dawned on me, well, he had a trade store. And that was her brother. But after O'Neill's death in, in 1825, two of the brothers went up and worked with Zachariah, their uncle. So he was an important person in, in their life. 
So St. Genevieve, here we are in 18, about mid-1817 was when I think that they came. The house is, of course, in the heart of the business district of, of St. Genevieve at that time. Their lives in 18. 21, I told you that the land had been purchased. I was talking to Carl Eckbert a couple of weeks ago at the history conference. We were talking and I said, who would have built the house for O'Neill? I know he didn't do it. He was a, a skilled craftsman, but he wasn't a carpenter. And he said, oh, probably the Pratt brothers' slaves would have built the house, but there is no documentation. There isn't a deed filed for the 1810 purchase, which no explanation why they would have sold the land but then not file a deed. And the only information that we have about that land is from an indenture that was written in 1839 by Pierre Menard and Felix Valley, I believe, where they were trying to get their debt back from Antoine's children for a debt of over $1,000 that he had borrowed in 1820. And in the document it says in 1820 it was stated that there was a new frame house sitting on the lot that the Pratt brothers sold to him in 1810. So that's the only source for that information that we know of, and even that's pretty sketchy. I believe that he continued to work for Menard. There is, in the Agatha Rayom papers and the Poupard estate papers, Agatha's lawyer writes that Catherine died in 1820. So whether she lived in that house or not, I don't know, because if it was built in 1820, she may never have gone inside the house. But again, things are so sketchy. I don't have the exact date of her death, nor do I have the exact date that the house was was built. But O'Neill is listed in documents like in the stray notices, and he was working on one of the road crews. There are documents here in town in the courthouse about him. So a little bit more than you find in others, but I've never found any documents that actually flesh out personal things about him, like how tall he was or whether he was a kind man. I think he was a kind man. From what I understand, he was plagued by debt, and I have a feeling if someone came to him and needed things, he probably gave it to them cheaper than he could. I don't know that Menard didn't take advantage of him, but I can't prove that. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. So Catherine died in 1820. I know that from documents he apprenticed two of his sons in the art of silversmithing, one of them Antoine and the third child, Joseph. They are listed, and I was telling Gary Stolzer the other day he should come and hear this because Antoine was arrested for 75 cents debt and they were afraid he was going to leave town. He was a flight risk, so <laughs> I thought Gary would get a kick out of that. And then at the time that Menard was trying to get their debt back from the O'Neill family, Joseph O'Neill gave an inventory. He listed his meager silversmithing tools, so he was a silversmith. And in the Felix Valet ledgers here in town, he is listed as having sold some silver trade items to them. So I know that he made an attempt at being a silversmith, whether he used his own mark or his dad's, I don't know. Well, I do have an idea about that. Maybe I'll talk about it another time. But basically, that fizzled out for him and Antoine both. And they all left the area by 1840. They were gone. So another thing is that Jim Baker has a talk about notorious St. Genevievians. And Antoine was actually sued by a local man named Michael Butcher, whose wife, and they lived in the house Caddy Corner across from the church at the corner. And Butcher accused Antoine of philandering with his wife Peggy, but according to the story, she philandered with a lot of people, so he was acquitted because they could never prove that it was true. So anyway, all the O'Neill children took an Irish name and they left town. So O'Neill's legacy, because even though he always was under the radar, you can track the things that he did, and he actually, in a, an in-depth study about the silver trade that was done by people in the know about the fur trade and silver trade ornaments, he's listed as being a major silversmith of the era of late, uh, late 1700 and early 1800s. And his work, when I show you examples, you'll see, compares with silversmiths from the era from Philadelphia and Boston. He did very beautiful work with very little tools. He obviously had a lot of skill. So I'm going to show you his domestic silver. The picture on the 
on your left is the Rogier picture was made, they think, here in St. Louis, but I know that it was not. You can see on the inside, and it looks like there's some marking on it, but I think it's the reflection from the, the photography. But on the inside, it says CR, which would be Constance Rosier. The one on the right is an Aspersorium font or a baptismal font. This is the Vigo silver, and it's actually, some of it is at Grouseland. And I understand that there is a legend in Vincennes that Francis Vigo and another rich merchant whose name was Nathaniel Ewing took $500 and went to Washington City to commission a silversmith to make them each a tea and coffee service set. That was the legend. But it was later found when they identified that the cartouche was actually Antoine O'Neill that they doubted that story. And specifically, the tea service, these were the parts that were made for Vigo, but the difference between his and Ewing's was he had his initials carved in them, and the Ewing silver was all plain. But I wanted to talk about this bowl that's at the bottom. It looks like a punch bowl, but it's actually a tiny, small bowl. It's at Grassland. If you're ever up there, you can look at it. But I learned something recently that I didn't know about that, and I found it interesting. In the 16th and 1700s, when you were eating your meal, this would sit above your plate, and if you had bones or scraps on your plate, you would put it in the scrap bowl. It's called a slop bowl or a waste bowl or a scrap bowl. But what I learned about this when I did some search on it was that associated with this tea set, the reason it was included, because there were no plates or any other dishes in it, it was mostly uh, spoons and then the silver, there was a creamer, there was a silver sugar bowl. But that bowl would have been for if you were drinking tea and your tea got cold, you'd swish it around because they used tea leaves, not tea bags like we use, swish it around and they would dump it in the waste bowl. So it was specifically made for a tea service set. I just learned that and I thought that was pretty neat. So this is the Ewing coffee pot. So I didn't have the Vigo coffee pot. And sadly, as I told you, he was a pauper at the time of his death. I believe he died in 1836. And he was indebted to so many people that he would hand over pieces of his silver service set to people that he owed a debt to. This one was actually just given to the St. Louis History Museum last, Octo or last October, and I got to go up and see it and take pictures of it. And it's very beautiful, but if you notice the handle has been replaced, it is very clunky compared to the sophisticated one in the other picture. And walnut is very just all over in Vincennes, and so I'm assuming that he hired someone to make that other handle, but this one has been replaced. You'll notice that it also doesn't have any initials on it. So Nathaniel Ewing's family actually acquired a lot of the Vigo silver, and they have it dispersed out in their family. Again, this is the Roger pitcher, um, the water pitcher. It's about 12 inches high. I was told, Lorraine Stang told me that this was offered to the dames back in her tenure when she was the director and they turned it down. And so it was given, sold to Yale University is who has it now. And it's another very beautiful piece. This is an Aspersorium font and it's a classic example of the kind of silver that he would have pounded out. He didn't have access to sheet silver. Sheet silver would be having a roller machine where you could feed hot silver in and as it cooled it would come out in a sheet and then they didn't have to hammer it. He didn't have access to that. So if that was available to him, it isn't in record. So it could be, but I, there's no record that he had a roller or anything like that. So at the top on the right, you can see the little angel. He would have carved that out of wax or maybe out of a soft wood. He would have poured it, that would have been the mold. He would have poured his silver into it and let it set and then come out. So that's why those all look the same. On the bottom he has the silver repargé and, and you can see he was quite a talented silversmith. I think his engraving's a little clunky but I mean he had simple tools so it was just him pounding with a hammer and making that design. Now we can go to the next one. These uh, silver dessert spoons are coffin handled dessert spoons. I like to think they were made for Pierre Lorimore who was um, the agent who worked with Menard uh, with Antoine O'Neill, he's exclusively the person who accepted silver from Antoine in the ledger books, but I don't know, and no one knows. But they're very delicate. They are owned here in town by a group from the church, so they will be some, in some way given to the O'Neill house. So sadly, 
O'Neill ended his life here in town. When I was up in Vincennes a couple years ago, I was at Grouseland and the people there, they're fairly familiar with Antoine O'Neill, but they proudly told me that they were, that he was Indiana's silversmith. And I said, well, actually he's our silversmith too because we have him and you don't. <laughs> and they didn't think that was funny, but he is buried in the Memorial Cemetery. I don't know if his wife is there or not. There isn't a burial record for her. So whether she actually died here or not, no one knows, only maybe Antoine knows, but so he ended his life here and I think that he ended his life, this is his burial notes from the Catholic Church here, and then one more. I think he ended his life in kind of a sad way because he was always plagued by debt and his kids picked up that debt, they inherited that debt. One of the sad things is that they inherited over a thousand dollars from their grandmother when their mother died. Her mother had died, so instead of her mother getting the money, it was her because her children got it because they were both dead. So why that was never applied to his debt, I don't know, because they were all minor children, but I guess back in that time the law was different. What was theirs was theirs, not his, not the father's. But he had 10 days before he died, Pierre Menard gave him or sent him $10, which I know was never paid back. Whether he was sick and needed it for medicine, I'm not really sure. But so he died here, his children all left the area, but his legacy is that house. And as I was putting this talk together, I realized that what I know about him is like having a group of puzzle pieces and I've put together certain vignettes and I know certain things about him. Will I ever have the larger picture put together? I don't know if I will or not, but it does show an importance to that building, why we should restore it, why we should elevate its status and let people know that it isn't the Thurman house, it is the Antoine O'Neill house. He built it, it, it was his, his, his um, residence and his workshop. And so I like to think, and I will continue to search for records because I'm fascinated by his family. So if anyone has a question. This I thought was funny. I, I always love to end my talks with this because I found this running 10 weeks straight in the in Indiana Sentinel paper, newspaper in 1820. Someone is seeking a lost tumbler, probably stolen. It has AO stamped on the bottom, who could only be made by Antoine O'Neill. And I never found out if they got it back or not. So obviously it was a valued piece to them. Maybe they just couldn't drink their ale without it. I just think it's kind of a Neat, neat way to end my talk. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. I've probably given you way more information than you thought you'd get in an hour. <laughs> but I'm pretty excited about Antoine O'Neill. I really like the information and I like the fact that he is, I believe, an integral part of this town and its, it's history. Maybe not the early history, but certainly the 1800 first years in 1800 history. So. How did you first get interested in well, I was on the committee with the church to restore the house and we were walking through and Jim Baker was talking and he would talk about certain things and he said, I believe this was the residence and I said, who lived here? And he said, a, a man named Antoine O'Neill, who was a silversmith. And I remember distinctly how I felt. I'm like, who was this guy? Very incredulous that somebody would come here from Quebec and live and, and, and be of that uh, you know, that elevated status as a silversmith. And I've never not wanted to know that, and I've always wanted to know more about it. So that's how I got involved. I initially just set out, in fact, shameless promotion of products, which you don't have to feel obligated at all. But one thing Jim Baker did say to me was, when you start researching him, try to find every piece of silver that you can about him and then compile it because I know there's never been a compilation of it published. So that's what this is. So I have more pieces than are in the in my talk. I have a an antique distiller in St. Louis who has a bunch of private owners of the silver and he gives me their images to use. And I've just sought the other ones out. I found this one and, and wrote to the, this is at the Francis Babe house in Windsor. I wrote to them and said, could I have an image to use in my book? And they were like, well, okay. <laughs> so, and then this one, the ear wheel is at Shadron, Nebraska in the Missouri fur trade. and. None of the people that actually own these pieces know anything about them, which is so sad. But it's kind of like Michelangelo in the, in the movie that was done with Charlton Heston and even said that, you know, rich merchants take that thing that I make and it becomes theirs. It's named for them and I lose that 
you know, that belonging of it. And, and I think that's what Antoine did as well, because so much of the silver is called the Vigo silver or the Ewing silver or the somebody silver. So that's how I got interested. And I'm still, I just recently um, found information because I have doggedly said from the beginning that Antoine O'Neill was not Irish, that I've never found a document that supported that. In fact, I found quite a few that say exactly that, that he was not Irish, he was French. Well, it turns out he was Irish. <laughs> yeah, I actually found, I actually found uh, French records in Meuse in France and his earliest ancestor was Germain Nell, and he came from Ireland and married in 1650 in Meuse, and he's listed as a squire for the king's, whoever the guy was, and it says he was from Ireland. So they were Irish, but they very much associated with French, and the next four generations were French before they came to Quebec. So what do you call them, French or Irish? <laughs> French, yeah, they were, but they were Irish, so. So I'll continue to find records because when I find these little jewels, I, I love it. I've learned how to read French just so I can read those records. And I, I just, I love it. I think it's kind of a neat thing for a retired lady to do. So that's what I do. Any questions? Nope. All right, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. And maybe you'll see me at another talk as I learn more about him. Thank you.